everything okay? Um, I think we are now recording, so just uh, for those of you who don't want to be recorded, uh, stay muted. Um, if you don't mind being shared, then please do share your, your views. Um, so welcome to the Synchronization Task Force workshop for today. Um, today, the focus is going to be on Pillar 2, which is fair culture. Uh, my name is Joy Davidson. I'm with the Digital Curation Center, and I lead Work Package 3 in Fair is Fair. Uh, my co-chair today is Angus White, who's also from the, D from the DCC and co-chair for Work Package 3. And Marianne Grootveld from Duns and Fair is Fair is kindly going to be the scribe. And Rita Menzies is, is taking care of the, the Zoom and the chat. So if you have any issues or problems or want to ask a question, please feel free to put it into the chat and uh, Rita will keep a, an eye on that for us. Um, as Marianne's putting into the notes now, uh, please do remember if you don't want to be recorded, just stay muted. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of very brief slides today. Um, we have 90 minutes for discussion. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder of what we're trying to do here with these workshops, and then we'll move into some discussion and I'll give you a bit more information going forward from there. Um, so just a quick reminder of what the synchronization task force is trying to achieve. Um, we know we're not alone uh, in this uh, EOSC landscape. There's a lot of other projects that have been funded by the commission and also other initiatives that are working to try and, and make uh, the European Open Science Cloud ecosystem viable and uh, workable. So what we're trying to do really um, initially with the other um, infra EOSC 5 uh, a, B, and C projects that we're kind of in the same uh, funding pool with was to try and, and make sure we're not duplicating um, any, any work that's already being paid for by the Commission. Um, we've extended the membership of, of the Synchronization Task Force to include some of the cluster projects as well. And as um, many of the EOSC working groups are also relevant, we have uh, invited them to take part in these workshops as well. Um, we also have brought in our um, European um, Fair Data Champions. Um, they are also very relevant because they're actually out there doing a lot of this stuff. So we wanted them to come in and to share their views as well with the group. Another key thing is not just to avoid duplicating effort. Um, we want to make sure that we can maximize the coordination. Um, and wherever possible, we want to encourage dovetailing of activities. And this is primarily what we're hoping to, to try and start to do with these workshops, is, is to work out exactly what sorts of things we're working on in the projects and where there is real opportunities for us to start to work together and to um, make, make things a little bit easier on ourselves, but also have um, better results overall. Uh, a reminder that we've been using the Turning Fair into Reality report as a sort of framework for us to assess um, just how well the landscape is reflecting the vision that was uh, put forward by Turning Fair into Reality. Um, there's this, Six, culture, uh, six pillars that we've been looking at. Um, today, we're going to be looking at fair culture, and this is in a little bit more detail. Um, you can see in the slide here that there are seven recommendations in this pillar. We will not be speaking about all of the recommendations today. We're, we're focusing on the priority recommendations today. Um, and if we have time, we'll start to look at some of the others, but um, it's probably more than likely that we'll focus mostly on recommendations four, five, and six. So looking at um, the development of interoperability frameworks, ensuring data management through data management plans, and crucially recognizing and rewarding fair data and data stewardship. So the way that we'll work the session, as many of you have already done these sessions before, um, we will skip the round of introductions today because I think most people have already um, participated in several of these calls over the last uh, week. So I think you probably all know who each other are by now. Um, by all means, feel free to, to restate your name when you're reporting back for your project, um, but we won't do a formal round of introductions. So as mentioned, we'll just focus on a discussion of each of the three priority recommendations today. Um, trying to figure out what each of the projects are currently doing to address this and to see where there might be um, potential for uh, cooperation. Another key aspect for this particular uh, series of workshops is to also figure out, are there any gaps? Are there other areas of work 
that are not reflected in turning a fair into a reality, that should be. So we will save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session just to make sure we have time to discuss that as well. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to encourage everyone to go to the shared notes that um, you had the link sent to you last night. Um, I have taken all of the information up to this morning from the spreadsheet and put it into the shared notes because I think it might be a little bit easier for us to, to work from that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. and move over to the shared notes. Um, we won't share the screen for that, but please, if you can, um, just go in. Um, you'll see a little comment at the top of the shared notes from Marian saying that collaborative note-taking is very much appreciated. So please do feel free to um, add in any information uh, for your project here as we go through. So just to, to reiterate, this session is about rec recommendations four, five, and six, which are the priority recommendations. Uh, we'll be focusing on these for the next 90 minutes. Um, what I've done is I've taken all of the information that people put into the shared spreadsheet and tried to put it into um, a table under each of the priority recommendations. So you can see uh, we have recommendation four, which is develop interoperative, interoperability frameworks. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, turning fair into reality, it's not just the broad recommendations, there are also sub actions under each. So I have tried to map what I found in the spreadsheets to uh, sub actions wherever possible. Um, if people don't see their information there and they didn't have time to, to add anything to the spreadsheet before the, the call today, please feel free to add bullet points under uh, the relevant table sections uh, as we go through this, and we'll use this as the, uh, the basis for the final output going forward. So when I was going through the, the uh, information that people provided in the spreadsheet, um, I thought it would be useful just to try and pick out some common themes, some things that uh, several projects were seeming to work on. Um, and what I would like to do is to just pick up on three things under recommendation four for uh, interoperability frameworks that came out to me as being areas of shared interest uh, across the different projects. Um, the first was that there was several projects who were looking to come up with recommendations, either on interoperability or semantics or um, you know, good practice. Um, there are several recommendations being put forward. Um, the other was metadata catalogs. Several of the projects are looking to do um, alignment and integration of metadata catalogs and uh, coming up with ways to make that happen. And the third one for the interoperability recommendation was use case and success stories. So those are the three areas I'd like for us to spend maybe about 15 to 20 minutes just working through. Um, as I mentioned, I've tried to pull out all of the information from the projects um, from the spreadsheet. Um, if you haven't, if you don't see your name in the, the, the notes right now, under the table I've uh, listed the discussion areas and um, we can pick up on, on each of these as we go forward. So the first point I wanted us to discuss um, were the recommendations. Uh, so recommendations for interoperability, semantics and good practice. Um, I had a couple of questions that I thought we could spend a couple of minutes discussing across the projects. The first was, to get a sense of what state your recommendations are in. Are they already published? Are they a work in progress? Or are they planned for somewhere down the line? Uh, and the second question was to try and get a sense of who is being targeted by your recommendations. So who is it that you're hoping will read these and, and actually put something into practice? So from the spreadsheet, I've, I've picked out that expands, uh, fair is fair, shock, escape, and the EOS Fair Working Group all have some interest or activity around this. So I thought we can maybe work our way through those projects and just hear from each of you um, on what it is you're actually doing. So maybe, maybe we could hear from Expands first about what you're doing with uh, recommendations. Okay, so that's me, I'm Abigail. Um, hello. <laughs> so what we're doing, I'm just gonna pull up your notes for a second, looking at what we've put in the spreadsheet and what we've got in the notes. Um, so around recommendations, you were asking 
where we are, what state and who they're for. Um, yeah. so we are currently at the moment, we have a deliverable due in August, uh, which is a draft uh, recommendations of uh, photon and neutron facility uh, data management for FAIR. And what we're currently doing at the moment is looking at the mapping, a sort of conceptual model, I suppose, of the metadata that you need throughout the to collect throughout the experiment lifecycle at a facility um, to ensure that your data and your data services are fair. Um, we hope to have those draft recommendations ready in August, but there will be a final version of that which comes out, I think, a couple years. It's two years on from that. Uh, so no, actually 18 months on, I think, something like that. Mm. So it's a draft, and then we're going to look at some uh, use cases, um, see how that actually plays out in practice, and then uh, produce the final recommendations. And who's that aimed at? Well, it's really aimed at uh, facilities, at users, at facility scientists, at uh, data curators, people who'll be managing the data. So there'll be different people who'll be involved in different roles that would be involved in different stages of this life cycle. I think that's the only best way I could answer that. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I think several of us have uh, multiple audiences that we'll be targeting <laughs> with the, the recommendations. Um, yeah. But that, that's really great. Thank you very much. And I think in our case as well, it's important to note that, that some of the recommendations will actually apply to machines. <laughs> yeah. So it, would be, it would be machines that will be doing the collecting at, at various stages. So, yeah. yeah. That's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, great. Uh, maybe, do we have somebody from Work Package 2 and Ferris Fair? on the call. Well, I can maybe just say that um, there is currently a set of um, recommendations that have been released through Zenodo. Um, they're currently available for public um, feedback. And they're primarily targeted towards the people who understand the technical issues at a research performing organization. So um, it's, a, it's a narrower audience um, for who would be reading this and what we would hope they would take away from it. Um, but it is currently out there and we will be similar to, to expands. They will be updated over the life of the project. So we'll be trying to gather feedback and trying to see um, you know, where we've missed things, where things might have to change. So that's currently where we are with uh, Ferris Fair Work Package 2. Um, is anybody from Shock able to talk about the recommendation work you're doing? Nobody from Shock on the call today. No. Okay, maybe then we can move over to the uh, Escape project. Do we have anybody on the call from Escape? Well, it seems like we've missed a few people who registered but have uh, provided information but are not on the call today, which is unfortunate. Um, the other group that I had put down here was the EOS Fair Working Group. Do we have anybody representing that initiative today? Hi, this is Neil Chu Hong. I can also see oh, Mark hello. on the on the list. Yeah, we had quite a few people registered. I'm just not entirely sure if they've all managed to uh, make it along here today. Um, do you, Do you have any information on on the recommendation from the interoperability uh, interim report that's coming? Um, I'm just kind of like looking into the notes. I. Um, I know. I, I don't know if Marta, you want to say something. Uh, just perhaps, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So we both, Neil and myself, we are from the Fair Working Group, and uh, indeed there was a document on uh, inter in the on the EOS uh, interoperability recommendation framework, and I understand that it will be sent for consultation with the community very soon. We have received the draft within the working group. 
and uh, I believe it was supposed to be sent out for consultation this week or next week, so you will be able to see that soon. Oh, that's great. Perfect. Excellent. So it sounds like there are several kind of activities currently coming up with recommendations and the current state of, of play. So um, I think the timing actually sounds pretty good if we're all currently working on the drafts that will be available for um, uh, community input. So maybe there could be an action for us to make sure that we all look at each other's recommendations and try to see what is coming out and make sure we're able to um, endorse any key messages that are coming out that we think are, are worth flagging up. So maybe we can add that as an action, uh, Marion, at some point. Okay, um, that was the information I had from the spreadsheets. Um, I know that not everybody had time to, to put their information into the spreadsheet. So I just wanted to check, were any of the other projects involved in, in the the synchronization task force workshops. Are you working on anything similar? Are there certain things that we should be keeping an eye out for? Doesn't sound like any other projects will be coming up with recommendations. If you do want to add anything into the notes, please do. Um, Otherwise, we'll assume that it's uh, really just expands and fair is fair that are looking to, to pick this up going forward and maybe with the fair working group. A joy maybe just to add to that and for everyone. So Neil and myself are part of the fair practice task force within the fair working group and we'll be working on the report as looking at fair practices and specifically also about interoperability and standards within commu research communities. But that's uh, nothing yet that we can share with you. We'll be writing that report uh, towards the end of June and will be available for a, co for a consultation in July. So we'll be sharing that with you. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. And you've also got a series of, um, well, a set of resources that you pulled together and some of these will talk about interoperability and then be useful to the community as well. Um, I think those yeah. are available already, aren't they? Yeah, they are already available. That's, that's a constantly updated document, so I can provide a link to, to people if that helps. We yeah, will be organizing a webinar also on the 9th of July where we'll discuss these outputs in more detail. So if that helps, I'm happy to add the links already to your spreadsheet or if people prefer, we can also do it in July when the report is also available. So I'm not sure what's easier for you at this, at this moment. Yeah, I think if people have the link just now and, and can have a look, that would be great. Yeah, sure. We no, do. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, well, if there was any other comments or questions uh, about interoperability and recommendations from anybody on the call? Um, hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah, I don't know if it's the term for the sh champions, ambassadors. Uh, yeah, it, we have uh, copied over your, your views wherever we could. So, um, but yes, please feel free to say anything. Yeah, hi, Joy, and um, everybody. I mean, what I see from, um, from the perspective of a um, multidisciplinary uh, research institution is that there is a lot of um, work going on within research communities, but uh, research is growing interdisciplinary. So I, I think there is a, an opportunity to uh, intensify work to make different uh, discipline communities to work together uh, to enable more interoperability. Like I'm facing, for instance, like a research project uh, involving people from chemistry with people from cultural heritage, for instance. So we need uh, data to be fair for these two different groups of research communities. Uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, I, I think we need more uh, tools, services that are, of course, sustainable, but to, to enable more collaboration amongst uh, research communities that, in principle, uh, seem not having anything to do uh, in common. And this is more and more um, uh, likely to happen. Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the things I noted from the shared spreadsheet was that shock 
unfortunately, I don't think we have anybody here today on the call, but one of their reports coming up is a report on metadata interoperability problems, and, and they will, will be looking at um, the social science and cultural heritage sort of community. So that, that might be something of interest to your particular use case. I think yeah. the other thing for us, um, it's always great to hear about these activities happening in research performing organizations. So um, one of the things we'll come on to a little bit later is more on use cases and, and implementation stories. So this sort of pilot that you're doing um, with different disciplines might be something that, you know, we could pick up and try to, to report out mm -hmm. deliverables. So that's, that's great to hear. Okay. Perfect. Um, any other views from anybody on the recommendations and, and various activities around interoperability and semantics? If not, I think then we'll move on to the next key theme of, of activity that came through the, the spreadsheet. Sure. And that, oh, yeah. yeah May Hi, I, Mark. Yes, I. Uh, Firstly, uh, really apologies for, for joining late. I'm, I'm sorry that that's at the, it's, it's probably at the limit of politeness. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. And, but um, I, I just decided to jump in because, you know, the topic that you just mentioned, uh, uh, you know, we've just had the, um, the International Virtual Observatory Alliance meeting in astronomy. It's, a, it's usually a, a one week uh, uh, meeting where the interoperability framework uh, for astronomy called the, the virtual observatory, which is really a, you know, an activity that implements you know, fair data and encouraging common standards and open science and all of this. So this just happened uh, last week in a virtual manner. Uh, so even in the difficult circumstances of the, of the, of the, the virus, the pandemic, uh, uh, interoperability is still a high priority for many people around the world. And, and there has been progress made uh, on the astronomy uh, interoperability framework that, um, and we were able to put, you know, we, so we will write that into deliverables of the escape project. So um, uh, in terms of news, yes, something happened last week in astronomy about interoperability of data and uh, things are going ahead. All oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, again, I think um, we'll come back to the use cases um, a little bit later. So that your point about things happening in the community um, and, and how we can maybe um, pick up on some of these. I think we'll maybe come back to that in just a minute. So I'll come back to you <laughs> for more information there. Um, and I did manage to pick up some of the information from Escape that you had put into the spreadsheet and, and put it into the table. So is, is there anything on some of the reports that Escape is working on that you wanted to, to flag up? Uh, I think the one of the main aspects from the escape point of view is that we really have the uh, the infrastructures involved and engaged, you know, meaning the S3 in astronomy and astroparticle physics. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the, the things that escape is really bringing this, helping those S3 projects to interface with virtual observatory standards. And all of this is about in the context of connecting to the EOSC. So there's a lot of joining I find that's going on there and uh, the participation in the events like uh, all the, the activities that you're um, leading here in Fair's Fair is a sort of another level of that again. So there's, I think there's a good connection between all of those things, although uh, it's quite a lot of effort to, to get a lot of deep understanding from one end of the system to the others. But uh, I think, I think, uh, this helps. Very good. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, well, maybe then uh, we can move on to the next sort of theme of activities that I saw through the, the information on the spreadsheet um, to do with interoperability, and that was on metadata catalogs. Um, there were quite a few projects who had put something in the spreadsheet to do with either coming up with harmonization, uh, integration, or coming up with APIs to help support um, the uh, production of different metadata catalogs that could be used across disciplines. So I had a couple of questions I thought we could pick up on for those projects who are doing something in this area. Um, the first was to try and get a sense from the projects in the call today, um, do you have any specific uh, repositories that you're looking to work with? 
in order to start working with metadata catalogs? Um, you know, are they specific research infrastructures as we're hearing from some of the, the projects um, which are focusing on RIs in the ESRI world? Um, others might be looking more at higher education institutions that are coming up with their own data repositories. Um, that's certainly something we'll be looking at in the Ferris Fair kind of scheme of things. But just to try and get a sense, um, do you have some repositories that you're looking to engage with? And this was one of the areas I thought really, if we are looking to try and improve interoperability across the disciplines, this would be a good area for us to try and join up on, I think, on the projects as we're starting to develop approaches and to try and test them. So um, those were the two kind of key questions I wanted to try and address under metadata catalogs. So, so maybe we can go back to Abigail um, from Expands and um, you could tell us a little bit about the work that you're planning to do in, in Expands around meta metadata catalogs. Okay, I'll do my best. It's not the work package I'm actually involved with, but I don't think there is anyone here from work package three, so I will go ahead unless someone shouts out. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> sadly not. <laughs> okay. Um, so my understanding of it, and I, I could be wrong about this, is that essentially many facilities have their own metadata catalogs in the photon and neutron science world. And the idea is to federate those, and we're working with PANOSC to have those um, link through PANOSC um, and then up into the European Open Science Cloud so that essentially scientists and facility users and others can access those via EOSC. That's essentially the goal. Um, and that will also has the added quite important effect of then enabling the data analysis services that we're also going to make available through EOSC. Um, EOSC ready data analysis services. So in our case, it is about the catalogs, but it's also about essentially the data analysis services because of the, the for example, the large amount of data that experiments produce. Um, Sometimes that's the kind of thing you do need to now and you have a specialist data analysis service available for. So that in a very simple nutshell is, I believe, what we're trying to do. And that's building on the work that we're doing in Work Package 2 around this, this conceptual framework of the metadata that's available throughout the experimental life cycle. So that can then feed into the catalogs, it can feed into the data analysis services. Oh, okay, that's great. And, and so you'll be working primarily with the, the research infrastructures again um, on this? Yeah, so quite a lot with yeah. PANOSC, obviously, and with EOSC as well. Yeah. And to, the, the aim is to get them federated through EOSC. Perfect. And, and maybe then we can move over to, to the PANOSC, if we have anybody from PANOSC on the call. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hello, John. That's John uh, from, from ESS. I, I think Abigail has summed up uh, what we're doing actually uh, al already. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, all, all the research infrastructures, all the photon and neutron sources have their own, uh, have their own uh, storage systems where they curate their data uh, with their own metadata catalog sitting on top of that. Uh, so in Panosk Work Package 3, the kind of key deliverable of that is a, is a federated API uh, structure which allows, uh, for example, a, a, any any actor uh, that has authentication credentials against the API to search across multiple uh, metadata catalogs. With the, uh, the the key idea really is is to allow, allow users uh, the ability to find their data and then, as Abigail said, run data analysis on the on the data that they find. Uh, so it kind of ties up with the data analysis services. Uh, so this is. Yeah, so that's work package uh, three in Panosk, which is uh, very closely linked with uh, with Expands because, in principle, our users at the S3 facilities are the same users at the national facilities. Uh, uh, and then there's a an, another work package in Panosk, which is uh, developing uh, authentication credentials. Uh, so some common federated access uh, f through EOSC in, into all of the systems which uh, are being developed in Panosk. But hopefully that makes some sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, if I could just add. If I could just add to that, Joy and John, it's also I think it's really important because others may not be aware that in the the photon and neutron community users will use many different facilities. So they, it's really useful for them to be able to pull their data from all up in one place, basically. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. So I, again, I think these kind of use cases that are coming through are really, really interesting and, and certainly we'll come back to that in a minute, I think. Um, but that's a really nice example, I think, of, of how Expands and Panos are, are working together. And I think that's hopefully something I know we've had um, some really initial discussions with uh, the people leading our work on metadata catalogs and work package three um, with the teams that Expands and um, hopefully with Panos as well. Um, just to see what we can take forward. Um, I can say very briefly what we're doing in Work Package 3. Um, we're looking more across disciplines and um, we're at the very kind of initial stages of, of the work looking into integration of metadata catalogs. And some of the initial thinking that we're doing is just trying to see what's there. Uh, so we've got a, a team at UC3M who's been looking into this. And some of the, the really basic kind of questions that there are thinking about now are, are really what, what is a metadata catalog? What constitutes a metadata catalog? Um, and um, some of these issues uh, are, are coming up and they're very kind of basic things, but um, it's that perspective of what people expect by these terms and, and what they would hope to find. So we're, we're very much hoping to learn from some of these other projects that are a little bit further ahead. Um, is there anybody on the call from Shock at the moment or is still still missing from shock because they also have some uh, work to do with the SSH catalogs and uh, I was hoping we could hear a little bit about that but if we don't have anybody on the call uh, we can maybe just share information as that comes through so I've added information to the table and you can have a look um, where that comes up um, so again one of the uh, other things I was hoping just to kind of touch on briefly with the metadata catalogs. Um, it sounds that, you know, clearly you know exactly who you'll be working with in which uh, facilities. Um, in Fair is Fair, we're looking to, to work with a much broader selection of, of repositories when we're uh, doing the work in metadata. So this would be a good chance for us to maybe find uh, suggestions of who we might work with. And I think, Isabel, you're, you're um, perhaps a good person for us to come and talk to in the first instance, just uh, with your particular use case. Okay. That's great. Um, did any of the other projects have anything that they were planning to do with regards to metadata catalog that they didn't have a chance to add into the spreadsheet? Joy, in, in astronomy, we, we talk about um, a registry which is essentially a metadata catalog. I mean, it's mm. the metadata of all the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, places that uh, publish resources to this metadata catalog. It's a, it's a mechanism which uh, is not centralized. It's harvested. It uses, uh, you know, standards like the OAI PMH. Is that you know, and we, so we are we are doing things like connecting that to EU DAT B to find so that mm. so that you know this metadata catalog is you know findable through the EOSC. Uh, uh, I guess I'm just saying this just to make sure that that matches with <laughs> what what you mean by metadata yeah. catalog in this context. Well, that's again. Um, this is one of the things we're looking at in the the short term in our thinking about metadata catalogs is, is exactly what is included and, and what sorts of things would we need to look at because it isn't as black and white <laughs> as we'd like to hope. Um, so yeah, that, that perspective is useful for us to take on board. Okay. Excellent. And um, so the last thing I really wanted to kind of pick up on for the first priority theme um, was this notion of, of exchanging of good practices and lessons learned, which is, um, recommendation 4.4 4. Um, and there were activities going on in, in different projects around capturing this sort of information on current practice and particularly in trying to, to show good practice. Um, one of the things I think we can pick up on is, is as Marta mentioned earlier, there's the EOS Fair Practice Task Force or Working Group, sorry. Um, and they have been spending uh, some time looking at the different practices and coming up with resources. So I, I think that certainly will be something that we want to, to come back to. Um, in Fair is Fair, we've got a few different areas uh, where we're trying to pick up on this. Um, 
one of them I can maybe ask Angus to, to say a few words about um, in his work trying to figure out the different state of practice in different communities. Um, he's come up with a, a sort of notion called an implementation story and a template that he's been working on. So maybe you'd like to say a few words about that, Angus? No, I guess you don't have anything. All right, well, I will maybe just fill in what I know. Uh, we, we have come up, it was um, something that came up in a different sort of collaborative working group that we're part of, which is um, led by Shock actually, and it's um, for communication and dissemination. And one of the key themes that has come out through that working group uh, which is dealing with the several of the cluster projects is thinking about the need for shared use cases and how we can start to show um, different um, issues and, and approaches to solving the issues. So this is something that, that we definitely think is a, a good thing for us to collaborate on. Um, so maybe the question I'd like to ask and is to those doing something or to anybody really on the call is, are you planning to do anything in relation to uh, use cases? Um, are you thinking about how you might present these? And is there potential for us to try and join up to do this in a way that we might be able to make use of a broader pool of use cases across the project? Um, does anybody have any views on that? Um, I mean, from our sites, um, I, we have a resource, but unfortunately it's in Spanish because we are targeting our research community. We are um, on a regular basis asking them to share their, their experience with, you know, data management and all things related. Uh, and we publish interviews uh, with um, uh, research project uh, leaders, and, uh, you know, from all different um, uh, disciplines because we are a multidisciplinary institution so I think it's, it's very useful for other uh, groups within the institution uh, to see that fair data it can be real uh, I mean you can accomplish it but I mean unfortunately it's in Spanish so maybe we can find ways to to select something and, and I can put it in English or yeah, I think even looking at the, the sort of templates that, that you present the information and that, that sort of thing would be really useful. Mm -hmm. um, I, so as I mentioned, Fair is Fair has been trying to come up with a, a template to record implementation stories and um, we've shared it with a few people, but we can certainly share that more broadly. Um, yeah, please. If anybody's interested. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Um, yeah, Neil? This is Neil Chu Hong. Um, so as Marta mentioned, as part of the EOSC FAIR working group, the FAIR practice task force has been trying to um, survey and review the landscape of different um, examples of FAIR in practice. And so one of the things we've done is collect published reports where different um, projects or groups or national um, organizations have been looking at the different use cases and uh, user scenarios of FAIR and more broadly open research, open data publishing leading to FAIR. Mm -hmm. um, but of, and I know that um, people um, like yourself, Joy, are aware of this work um, as we've been trying to do our synchronization with FAIR's FAIR, but more broadly, uh, if people do have reports that they are aware of from their own communities, which may not have had wider uh, dissemination, it would be great if you could send those to us and we can compile them into the collection. Yeah, that's great. And I think Marta's just dropped the link into the chat for the collection and, and Marian's added it to the notes as well. Um, it came out, I think, maybe last month. I think it was released for public comments. That's um, right. It's, it's a very nice set of resources and it's very well described, I think, you know, in terms of, of how we consider making 
these uh, resources more useful to a broader set of communities that it's, it's a really nice bit of work you guys have done. So. And also please do feel free to give us feedback um, in the way that we're presenting this information where we've been aware, we've, we've tried a couple of iterations of how to present um, a list from just being a, a simple list of, uh, of the publications and their DOIs to, um, to something which helps people understand which reports might be most useful for them to read because in many cases uh, a report will be of interest to, to one person because it mentions a particular aspect of FAIR but might not be useful to another person. So if you have any feedback about the presentation, please let us know. Perfect. Um, okay, well, I think we will maybe draw a line under recommendation four. I think the, the information we've got there is, is a useful starting point, and there's certainly some pointers, I think, for some follow-up discussion, discussions, even between a few of the, the projects to try and, and join things up. Um, I think we already had a, a chat about uh, Isabel's points about cooperation is needed in more uh, interdisciplinary tools and standards. Um, so the next uh, priority point that we wanted to have a look at today was um, everybody's favorite data management plan. And um, there is quite a lot of activity in the different projects uh, going on. Um, as I mentioned before, you can have a look at how I've mapped it to the various sub actions and feel free to um, amend as you see fit or to add any information that isn't uh, captured. Um, but what I was wanting to pick up on for, for this particular recommendation was just the work that people have reported on in developing templates uh, for data management plans for different communities, um, different uh, stakeholder groups. And I just wanted to see if we can maybe pick up from each of the projects that are active in this area to see, you know, who are you working with? What kind of areas are you trying to cover? Um, is it researchers that you're looking to target? Is it data stewards or people who work in, in uh, support role? Um, and are you uh, planning to work with any specific data management planning tools to um, incorporate your, your templates? And will you develop any sort of associated guidance for, for users? So the, the projects I've picked up on from the spreadsheet that seem to be doing something in this are NIFOS, Panos, uh, expands and fares fair, but by all means, if there are other projects, we can we can hear from you too. Um, so maybe, do we have anybody from Nepos? Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, Andreas. Yeah, hi. I think is here. So yeah. So let me first tell you a few things about. Uh, I mean, what are the categories? I mean, of uh, let's say the stakeholders we are targeting. Um, so first of all, of course, we're interested in in researchers as well as data uh, stewards. Um, so um, and uh, the idea is to produce fair data management plan via Arcos. This is the the main plan of uh, of of NIFOS. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I think all this will be documented in a deliverable. It's the deliverable is D five point four point five, which is uh, called delivery of legal, technical, and procedural tools, and it will be uh, delivered by the end of November twenty twenty. Um, so once this is delivered, uh, I mean, the, it will be uploaded in Zenodo, and you will be um, given the the link. Um, so, um, yeah, that's all from, from NIFA. So unfortunately I cannot comment more, uh, on that. Um, no, that's great. And, and you're working specifically with the Argos tool. Exactly. Yeah. We are working specifically with the Argos. Yeah. And is anybody wanting to say anything from the Panos side and the activity that you're doing with your data management planning? Yeah, uh, the the idea behind this is, I guess, uh, there's, there's a number of uh, motivating factors. Uh, the f the first is to uh, the, the the time users apply for beam time at, at a facility, for them to understand how they will deal with the volume of data that they will produce, because this is uh, 
this is becoming uh, a problem for facilities and for users uh, jointly really it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jointly owned problem the, vo the volume of data uh, so the, the data management plan tool that we're planning to to implement is something which sits uh, with uh, the access the proposal uh, access mechanism uh, which aims to uh, suggest to the users when they when they when they apply for let's say four days of beam time to to do some kind of diffraction measurement at a, at a photon source or a neutron source what the volume of data will be uh, created and how it will be curated by the facility uh, and what services can be uh, made available uh, from the facility to to be used with that data uh, so the the reason why it's a uh, uh, a kind of dual owned twofold issue is one when it gets the users thinking about how they will manage with the volume of data that they're going to produce from the experiment that they propose and two it helps the facility provision the resources uh, to basically curate that data uh, in, into into some kind of uh, long-term storage and also provision the data services uh, required to well analyze the data for want of a better word uh, so it's a it's 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 for that uh that's that's the kind of objective really it's uh so, so in that respect um you would be very much seeing the information held within those data management plans being really useful to the research infrastructure for, for planning and resourcing and budgeting on all the rest of it yes exactly it's something which I mean, neutron sources maybe are not the, big, the bigger data uh, producers, uh, but photon sources and, and free electron lasers produce a lot of data, and it's it's useful, I think, from from the the management level of those facilities uh, to understand that their user programs, in principle, create a, a a large volume of data, and that has to have some resources associated with it for it to be made fair, for want of you know a, be a better word. Uh, and of course, uh, the the users of of photon and neutron sources, generally speaking, I mean, a blanket statement, but they're not necessarily used to working with large volumes of data, uh, and they're certainly not used to uh, using data management plans. They they may have their own data management plan, uh, or they you know data management strategy, uh, but the, these these are things which uh, from the community side are not necessarily uh, socialized and that's another reason to start to implement this right at the beginning when people apply for the time and do you foresee any kind of like training and guidance having to be developed in parallel to, to yes there is a yeah there's there's a big there's a there's an awfully a big need for for training of of the user community and also training of the facilities and uh, research infrastructures as well uh, that in Panos is part of the training work package and I can never remember what the work package number is <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a training work package where we aim to have some uh, e-learning uh, resources uh, around use of the facilities but also uh, use of the data services That's great. Uh, and one last question um, because you're kind of focusing on the research infrastructure as being the place asking for the data management plan as part of the beam time request, um, are you considering how it might have to be harmonized with um, other data management requirements, um, either coming from funders or organizations? Is that something that you'll be thinking about as well? Yeah. So this is another this is another motivating factor because we know from uh, from well from from journals. Uh, they they require uh, for publication some some access to data and some plan about how that data will be made available. Uh, so the the idea that the facilities the research infrastructures take uh, make make this part of their uh, responsibility and takes away some of the responsibility from the user community, uh, which hopefully is a, is a is a valuable service. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so maybe maybe we can switch over to um, expands now because I, there's there's similarity between the, the, the two. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Abigail? Um, so again, it's really interesting for me to hear about Panosk's uh, approach. So I think we're sort of we obviously are working 
in court, we'll have to coordinate with that as well because we need to have similar data management plans in, in for our whole community. Um, and obviously we have the same, many of the same issues with the volume of data. I think what, one of the things that we're really focusing on is it expands, is you were asking about, um, you were asking about how it integrates with, for example, funders data management planning requirements. And that's definitely one of the issues is that it's a big ask for users to have to produce a data management plan every time they might want to come to a beam line to use, you know, for four days use of that beam line or something. So one of the things we're definitely trying to do is to create a template that is automatically populated as much as possible. And I think John sort of referred to that. So based on the methods that are going to be used or the particular instrument that be, would be used, certain aspects of that template could be automatically populated. So the idea is to kind of try and reduce the amount of of work that the actual user has to manually do around that data plan, but likewise to make the data plan active so that it follows the user as they proceed through the experimental life cycle. And again, that work that we're doing around the metadata available during the experimental life cycle stages that will feed into the data management planning that we're doing. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, are you doing anything with the machine actionable data management planning RDA group on, on this? Is uh, not at the moment, but it sounds okay. like it could be. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if Andy Rauber is on the call. Um... Yes, on the call. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you have anything um, on Thomas's work with the... Uh, no, definitely, but I mean, I'd, I'd probably put you directly in contact with Thomas, because I'm, I'm sure Thomas would love to hear um, about your, your experiences there. And it's very similar to the stuff that we are doing locally as well, where we think that the data management plans should be pushed as far as possible away from the actual researchers, because a lot of it deals with infrastructural issues that can be populated automatically in the back, on the back end side and only having the researcher fill their native research um, intention parts, basically. So um, that should align very, very nicely. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. That, well, that, that's good that that connection's been made because I think that will be a really <laughs> useful one. And there's actually a hackathon coming up, I, I think, later this month. Um, that yeah. group, so that, that could be a nice use case to, to start with. Yeah, that'd be lovely to, to see and, and showcase some of these examples. We wanted to do, a, Atomic wanted to do a physical hackathon, but yeah, this has now been shifted to the virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah. should just add that that we are actually we haven't even actually started this task yet beyond initial discussions. That's the best time <laughs> to go to a hackathon. <laughs> That's why it's a hackathon, you know. <laughs> you don't expect That's it to roll out a finished software product with processes in place and roll roles as signs. <laughs> this is something that we're currently starting to work on. Uh, we have a developer who's just okay. uh, DMSC. One of his uh, objectives is to start working on this automated DMP uh, and the integration into the user office software. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that would be good if you could keep us in, in the loop on that as well. Thanks. Yeah, I'll make sure that a link goes into the notes later um, so you can register for that. because I think it should be an interesting session. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, Angus, you. did you want to add anything on the data management planning side? In terms of fair I just that uh, in, in recommendations will be pointing to the RDA uh, groups um, standard and um, later in my package three we're hoping to uh, do some work with uh, DMP online uh, to use that standard and uh, the API in DMP Online to uh, make some of the information in the DMP accessible to repositories that um, would have that kind of use case. So to help them provision for uh, metadata standards uh, or uh, storage or other needs. Yeah, I think that's a Good point that you brought up there actually as well as um, I think use cases around the DMPs are something that we could stand to have a little bit more of. Um, so again, if people have, as you're planning and, and sounds like some people are like us in the early stages. So um, if we maybe want to start thinking about again, a shared 
way of describing use cases, it could be quite useful. Any other projects doing anything on data management planning or templates that they wanted to, to flag up before we, we move on to the, the next point? No. Okay, well, I think in light of time, um, I'm not going to go too much into the other key area of activity, which was around recommendations, but we can certainly come back to that in future meetings. Um, I just wanted to give uh, the, the European Group of Fair Champions, um, those who haven't already had a chance to say anything on the topic, because we got some comments from, from Andy, Mark, and Isabel, and I just wanted to, to give you a chance to say anything on the topic of data management planning that maybe hasn't come up yet or you'd like to raise? Um, so, yeah, maybe I can, I can say something. Um, uh, so at the Research Council in Spain, we have um, uh, fair data uh, mandates um, that came into force last year. So one of the tools we've produced is a um, uh, harmonized um, data management plan for our, the, the researcher community because as it's been already said, it's, it's a big ask um, to, to, to be waiting for researchers to produce um, uh, a very detailed exhaustive uh, plan and also because on many occasions they don't know about the um, research infrastructures, the facilities and the security measures, the long-term preservation uh, plans uh, being put in place by, the, by their institutions. So um, this is one step that we, we already um, took uh, to provide them with a template, also to harmonize uh, institutionally. Uh, how data have to be managed. I, um, um, what else? We are also providing training for the research project uh, managers for them to learn about um, things like um, uh, licensing and copyright handling and uh, metadata standards, things that are more close to their day-by-day uh, -by -day work and not so much about um, uh, preservation strategies or resources provided by the by the institution. So I think we have to separate uh, these two things, what is provided by the institutions and what is uh, supposed to be done by the researchers. Yeah, I think that, that kind of comes back to the notion of um, taking as much out of the burden of the researcher as possible and trying to populate it with um, things that we, we can automate. Um, and yeah. in your case, it's sort of a, a manual, <laughs> seamless behind the scenes kind of automation in that respect, I suppose. That's yeah. Great. Um, I, I think your use case, again, um, it would be interesting to have a look at your harmonized template, um, if you would be willing to share that, just so um, we, we could have a look, because mm -hmm. it could be a good case study for us to flag up. Um, Andy or Mark, anything else you'd like to share? on this topic before we move on? Hmm. Not really, apart from, I mean, these data management plans, they have served for many years a very good purpose in terms of awareness raising and making everybody aware of the importance of proper data management. I guess we should really push very quickly now to move on to the next step before people realize that the way we have been using them for awareness raising is utterly useless for real data management. You know, collections of hundreds of PDF documents as data management plans being archived somewhere is mm. wonderful storytelling, but <laughs> you can't convince any researcher that this is actually of any use because they know that nobody will ever look at those hundreds of documents five years later. So I think um, appreciating the use they have had in terms of awareness raising, we need to know to be open enough to say, okay, that's what we showed to you so that you understand what they are. Here is what will be coming up next and what is actually useful, which is you know, structured data management plans that are living documents and not even documents as such, but you know, structured data, well, data structures that, that are evolving and adapting and that are filled by as many different stakeholders as needed and as little as possible by the researchers. Yeah, great point. I think that the key point, I think, for this recommendation and turning fair into reality, one of the things was to maybe focus on the usefulness of the information in it. So I think that's a, a really good point to, to focus on uh, before we move on to the, the last of our recommendations. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes 
for this one, um, and I'm sure we won't get to scratch the surface. Um, this is the very thorny issue of, of recognizing and rewarding fair data practice and fair data stewardship. Um, several of the projects are tackling this in one way or another. Uh, NIFOS, ESCAPE, uh, Fair is Fair to a certain extent. Um, EOSC Synergy is, is doing some interesting things around badging as is Fair is Fair. So because we don't have a huge amount of time on this and it is such a wide ranging one, uh, I thought we could focus on the fair assessment and badging um, as, as part of our discussion. So maybe if we could hear from you know, uh, EOS Synergy, or Jerry, or is it you representing the project today? Yeah, I'm here. So maybe it's just important <clears throat> to mention for EOS Synergy that it isn't a focus on fair as such. So the focus on badging is really related to software and service quality assurance. Okay. Um, and it's also automated software and service quality assurance. So the project is, first of all, looking at which of the criteria that need to be in place as a kind of a minimum uh, quality and maturity um, level. And then the idea is to have kind of a, a various uh, ranges of badges available with associated metadata to say kind of on a scale, which level of um, quality assurance can be given for, for services and software, you know, being basically connected or integrated as part of the EOSC. Mm -hmm. Because of the work that's being done associated with FAIR and related to, you know, like we just mentioned, data management planning for, for these yeah. uh, service providers, there's also kind of an idea of, okay, how can we partner more closely from EOSC Synergy with work that's ongoing with this topic in FAIR is FAIR and see that if there is a, kind of a badging mechanism that's going out, can it also include some kind of aspect of fairness as well? But um, yeah, that, that's something that's kind of coming across through this common collaboration um, and, and kind of a, a close working between the projects, but not necessarily something that's a, a guaranteed output of the project. And, and in terms of yeah, synergy, is there a particular community that you're working with or is it multidisciplinary? So the project is working with um, four different um, uh, so it's, it has kind of a focus on thematic services and there's four different areas that, that it focuses on. One is earth observation, one is biomedicine, and off the top of my head I don't want to mention what the other two are. At the moment we're working very closely with uh, service providers from earth observation and I know that there will be other uh, service providers integrated as the project continues. I don't know if maybe Isabel wants to mention as well in case she has more, more at the top of her head the, the other domains involved. Yeah, so we also have um, earth sciences and um, environmental uh, climate uh, change um, communities. Okay, I mean, I think listening to what you're saying about the quality assurance, um, it does very much feed into what we were just talking about, moving towards more useful data management plans, and especially if they're living documents that um, kind of start at the at the outset of any new research project and, and, and when you deposit your data in a trusted repository. Um, yeah, I think I, I didn't mention it during the last part of the conversation, but I think one of the interesting kind of add-ons or added value of the project is that um, so some of the partners are, are commercial partners or they're, you know, they have one foot in science and one foot in, in um, uh, more kind of a, a commercial commercial purposes. and there are all kinds of intermediaries and third party service providers as well. So there's a big piece of work looking at which are the kind of um, service level agreements that are needed and also just introducing these kind of different ideas that were, you know, have become more mainstream in science, but for commercial service providers, the idea of the data management planning for some of them, at least it's, it's something that they obviously do in their own way, but not in the way that we know as part of the, the life cycle of research. I'm, just, I'm wondering, um, do, you, do you have the criteria yet? Is, is there a draft set of um, quality assurance criteria that is available? For software, there is a baseline software quality assurance version four, I think at the moment that is available in GitHub. I can share the link in the chat maybe or put it into the notes. And also, but for, for in terms of service, it's still very much at the ideation phase of what's needed. And, and would, 
would something like this be of interest to uh, other panels or expands or any of the groups who are looking at the sort of life cycle approach in your own communities? Would, would this yeah, I think at least um, there, there is some kind of crossover in terms of the, the, the people and, and projects that, that are involved with um, the photon and neutron science and the Yes Synergy project. So I can't speak in terms of, of um, people and which overlap it is exactly, but I know that in meetings I've been in for EOSC Energy before, there has been good representation of people from that community. So um, they're definitely integrated in the talk process. That's great. Um, I don't know if we have anybody from Work Package 4 on the call from Ferris Fair, um, but just to, to flag up, um, if, if anybody is, you can jump in. Um, as, as Jerry mentioned, he's also on Ferris Fair as well as the Aus Synergy. Um, Ferris Fair is also doing um, a task that is looking at fair assessment, um, so assessing data sets. And there is some work going on both on a manual level, but also an automated um, fair assessment. Um, and the idea is that at some point we will then start to badge data sets. Um, so you could see how this kind of use case might feed into data management planning and especially machine actionable data management plans, um, how these kinds of things might need to work together. Um, is anybody on the call that would like to add anything? Um, Anu or Ilona? Maybe I'll If just, not, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just jump in again that I, this kind of process of uh, looking at what are minimum kind of criteria, which sort of tool needs to be developed, and then how is there ongoing verification of that uh, and maintenance, uh, if it's maintenance in terms of keeping a data set fair or maintenance in terms of keeping a service fair or, or software fair, or to make sure that the EOSC isn't this kind of graveyard of broken links. I think badging is one of the, the things that obviously comes very close to the EOSC was a participation working group. And I think um, it seems more and more that this idea of badging and certification is popping up in lots of different environments. So I know as well with ESP Nordic that there's a um, uh, work that's being being done as well to look at um, giving PIDs to to uh, service service providers as well. And, and I think that's linked with with the same topic basically of. Um, uh, how can we have a, a good overview and, and ensure some kind of um, minimum standards for, or yeah, minimum rules of participation for being involved, but also making sure that once people are involved, that they, they stick to the rules of the game. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's oh, sorry, Joy, I think it's probably worth mentioning there that one of the things we're looking at um, across the board here is, is addressing change in periodicity. Because, uh, as Jerry mentions, it's really important to be able to uniquely identify those repository organizations. Um, but at the same time, um, the repository reviews tend to be on something like a two to three year cycle, uh, whereas we need to identify uh, the change point for uh, a fair object where it needs to be retested for fairness. So there's a little bit of a mismatch and a complexity there that we need to, we need to work through. And that, that obviously impacts the badging as well. Yep, it certainly does. And, and who issues the badges and who values <laughs> the badges and all the rest of it. Um, actually, I, I wanted to bring in, I, I know Nifos and Escape both added some, some bullets into the spreadsheet about work that they're doing. Um, for Nifos, it was more on, on incentives for supporting re research data management and FAIR. Um, and for Escape, it was looking at uh, a deliverable that would touch on some sort of recognition recognition for data stewardship. I just wanted to, to see if either of you had a, a kind of sense of how useful that the badging might be for something like that. Do you think it would be an incentive? Or would it depend on a number of factors? Well, if it's at the, if it's at the researcher level, uh, it probably just seen as another administrative task to do. And I'd be a little bit worried about that, that, that the institutional or sort of research infrastructure level, uh, it can be more interesting so long as there's not, you know, 20 to choose from or something like that. So uh, I think it can be 
it, it's not clear to me how it will go. Uh, if there is a sort of fair badging that sort of gets recognised in, you know, touching the topic of uh, of uh, rewarding, uh, you know, publishing data and uh, good data management might work. Um, I, I don't see it how, how it all fits together. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, with, with badging, there's always been um, that sort of challenge as to who issues the badge and whether they have any sort of credibility <laughs> to, to say what's good, what's not good, and um, does anybody value it? So there are lots of um, sort of practical questions, I think, that, that remain. Um, but it certainly, is, is one of the kind of tangible things that we've seen in terms of recognizing and rewarding uh, practice. Um, it's something that you can evidence, whereas some of the others uh, take a little bit more detective work to, <laughs> to, be, to provide the evidence. Um, did anybody from NEFOS have any views on, on judging or indeed anything else to do with the recognizing and rewarding fair data stewardship in practice? Nothing else to add? Okay, fair enough. Um, well, I think it would be good if, if we could pick up on this. And I think particularly um, since EOS Energy, I think has shared um, your, your draft criteria, we'll also share the, the outcomes from Work Package 4. Um, so we've got some draft criteria that have just come out. We will make sure that we put the links in here. And we'd certainly be interested in people taking a look at these, not just from the um, reward and recognition point of view, but also thinking about things like use cases in, in terms of uh, automating data management plans. Um, so we're running into the last 15 minutes and there were two last questions uh, um, I wanted to pick up um, that we were asked to address across all of the different uh, synchronization task force meetings. Um, the first was just to kind of consider across the whole pillar, we looked at three priority recommendations uh, we didn't have a chance to look at the supporting recommendations, but in terms of interoperability frameworks, um, ensuring uh, research data management through data management planning, and recognizing and rewarding uh, practice in data stewardship. Um, are there other things that need to be factored into the fair culture pillar in addition to those three priorities? Is there anything missing uh, that should be there? Nobody, nobody thinks there's anything additional that, that needs to be added into this. If not, that's fine. <laughs> we don't have to <laughs> come up with, with additional work if, if there isn't any there. Um, but by no, all means, I, I think. Oh yeah. I, I like. No, I, I mean it's a very general consideration, and it's also a personal view. But I, I think that uh, the secondary recommendations within this pillar are really important. So yeah. I don't know, you know, all the uh, inner works to decide that these were secondary, but to me, uh, all the issues about, you know, cost of data management and how to prioritize fair digital objects and how we link these with long-term preservation strategies, um, to me, I mean, they are really important issues. So. Uh, I would put them, you know, on a higher level. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree. I, I think budget implications for all of this are often very difficult to quantify. Um, so definitely I would agree wholeheartedly that we need to tackle this and get a better sense of how much it costs to do this and who's going to pay for it over time. Exactly. I think, you know, <laughs> Herve also mentioned that um, there will be periodic reassessments of FAIR and, and what fair means will change over time. So there are costs associated with that and I agree. So mm -hmm. I, I think we could maybe flag that up as, as a really crucial area. Uh, in, in our project in Ferris Fair, we came up with a few policy enhancement recommendations and costs. And okay. mm -hmm. that, that certainly was one of the things we, we prioritized as needing to happen both at the institutional level. So we need uh, report uh, support units in the institution 
to be able to tell you exactly how much it's going to cost to, to do X, yeah. Y, and Z so that it can be asked for in, in grant applications. And similarly, grant applications have to be able to um, allow those costs to be requested. Um, currently, with things like indirects and overheads, it's not always the easiest way to, to request these and to, to get covered. So I think I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, any other views from anybody? Yeah, Joy, maybe just to mention there on the point on costing, if it's okay, um, that there, there are views on this kind of cost and the cost of running the EOSC infrastructure once it's, a, once it's been set up, contained in the EOSC hub and EOSC federating core uh, work. So I'm not sure if there's a new version of that which has been released, but there was a version released at least um, last year towards the end of the summer, which was discussed in the Budapest meeting in November. And I know that since then there has been a, a straw man report published by the um, uh, EOS Sustainability Working Group as well, which also contains, you know, uh, detailed kind of numbers, hours, person count for, for kind of activities um, which fall into these kind of different contexts related to the EOS Federating Corps. And uh, I think it would be important and, and good for people who have this kind of uh, view on the data stewardship that's needed, the, the front office and back office approach needed for data curation, research data management, to be really be trying to involve themselves and have a good look at that and make sure that it's realistic and that the human and machine interaction is also kind of being accounted for fairly and that it isn't people imagining that robots are going to do everything and solve all of our problems <laughs> in a couple of years because we all know that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. Jerry. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. Abigail. Could I just interrupt for a moment there? Thank you. I just had a question. Does that also, does that report look at the things, so not just people costs for things like data stewardship, but I mean, certainly in our community, one of the really big issues is, is things like storage costs and just machine costs, basically, given the huge volume of data. So does it look at that as well, or is it more about sort of roles around data stewardship and, and how much those might cost? I think it only looks in terms of quantifying things at the, what's considered as part of the core. Um, and then after that, if it's something that sits outside of the core, I don't think it's been budgeted. So I, I don't imagine that it does, but I, it's a long time since I've looked at the report. So I'm a bit fuzzy on the details, I would say. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry. I'll, I'll take a look. I, yeah, I think it's just one of those really tricky things because member states who support research infrastructures will already be paying for certain things. And it's, you know, what will be over and above that we have to think about to, to participate in EOSC and to do that in a fair way. So there, there is lots of, lots of ambiguity, I think, that we still definitely need to get clarity on and, and to do that collectively, I think, would be better. And I know historically with the ESFRIs, how things are costed can differ quite widely across the different research infrastructures and uh, indeed across different research performing organizations there's a lack of standardization in many of these instances so the more we can do to try and understand these from a shared perspective i think the better so i think we're getting close to time um, one thing i would just like to also say as, as in a similar vein to to isabel um i also think that the re the recommendation 20 about trusted digital repositories may need to be moved up to a priority recommendation um, Primarily basing this on, you know, the number of projects who added information into the cells in the spreadsheet, there is an awful lot of activity going on. So if there is activity going on, I, I think we could say that this is a priority and that is something that is being addressed now. So maybe we just need to change the status of this one. Um, and indeed, I would like to kind of suggest, since we didn't have a chance to talk about um, trusted digital repositories, um, maybe we try to find another a chance to let projects come together to discuss this because there is an awful lot of work going on and it would be good to try and join up. Um, right, the last question then is, um, are there any other recommendations that are not addressed? So we've kind of looked at the priority versus supporting, um, but are there things that you think are just completely being overlooked at this point and, and should be added into somebody's Radar, now's your chance. So 
it's 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 oh yeah andy go ahead yeah, so I mean, it's, it's not overlooked, but it's something I notice in, increasingly is this whole fear discussion that the focus tends to be so much on, on data that can actually be shared and is openly available. Whereas fear always obviously has been stressing from the onset that open doesn't mean, you know, freely accessible to all and on and so on and so forth. But putting a bit stronger focus in, in all the aspects across all the, the recommendations on actually kind of in inverted comma closed data so data cannot be freely and accessibly shared but which can be only you know, this data visiting versus data sharing concept has been pushed against us mostly due to misunderstandings quite frequently when we were arguing for you know fairness of data and it was basically you know swipe the side saying you know, we are talking real data here not things that can be shared in the public uh, we were, always had to push very hard to say, well, this doesn't <laughs> exclude them from being fair and, and all of those. So maybe putting a bit stronger focus um, on these types of data that are massive and, you know, be it privacy concerns, be it industrial or commercial concerns, whatever. So just pushing that up in the, across, uh, across all recommendations on the agenda maybe might help it gaining wider acceptance. Yeah, I, I think certainly that is something that's come up several times recently um, is just the need for greater clarity on what are legitimate exceptions for not sharing and how can those be made uh, explicit in metadata, both of the repository side, but also maybe at the data management planning side. Um, and, and yeah, but, but even here, I, I guess we shouldn't limit ourselves to providing legitimate reasons for not sharing because people will always come up with hundreds of reasons that are then you need to be judged for their legitimacy but for providing solutions that allow data to be fair, even if it is closed data. Because there is so many different ways of, of you know, making only the metadata accessible, finding out about it, um, having automated processes of uh, requesting access, different types of access, um, which might be very restricted, which might be you know, with all kind of anonymity constraints, which might be using homomorphic encryption where you never see the data, but you can still compute on it. So there is, so many different layers and it's all possible and you know basically any type of data even the most secure ones can be made fair mm -hmm. to different degrees and it and it is supported by the recommendations so there is nothing in the the recommendations that prevents that data from becoming fair it's just that the focus has been so much on the public data on the free shareable data that people seem to conf uh, still confuse the, the concept of fairness with the concept of openness and even worse, free availability and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. And I think it can put some people off really before they even engage mm -hmm. if, if that um, misconception is not <laughs> uh, broken down. So that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, Andreas raised a really good point here, which we're facing in our object versus repository work, which is that when you look at some of the more naive interpretations of kind of uh, the different fair and the different fair uh, principles, they feel notionally positive and easy, but when you start to move them into the world of metrics, it's far too easy to take a extremely well protected data set full of personal data and apply a very low fair score just because it's being appropriately managed. So that is a very important balance to be struck. Well, Great. So I think we've, we've identified pretty much then a, a good couple of points under each of the last two questions that hopefully um, can be fed back into the various activities. Um, so I just, I just like to then open the floor very quickly to anybody who hasn't had a chance to say anything but has been hoping to, to say something. Now is your last chance. And if not, then it just for me to say thank you very much for, for taking the time out. I know many of you have been joining several of these uh, sessions over the last week, and it, it is a significant amount of your time. So we really do appreciate the fact that you've been willing to, to join these and to try and help us to see where we might be able to join up a little bit more effectively. There are certainly a few areas that we will pick up on from this session that we will take forward and try to figure out the best way to do that. Um, a reminder that the spreadsheet is still available and these shared notes. Um, I would actually say probably the best thing is to add anything that you want to the shared notes because this is what we will use to form the basis of the, the report coming out of these workshops. So if you do want to add anything, by all means, uh, these will still be available. 
And just a reminder that there is a, a final workshop that will take place. Uh, Marianne, what, what day is it for the, the final panel? I'm sorry, Joe. Joy, what did you say? Uh, the, the final panel workshop for the synchronization task force is that? Yeah, it's on the 11th of June. The 11th of June. Great. Yep. Thank you very much. So we will send out a reminder about that. But thank you all very much for taking the time and sharing the information. And we will uh, work on the shared report and let you know when it's ready for you to, to review and to add some content to. So thank you very much. And we will be in touch shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.